Okay, so we are going to speak about uh, computational chemistry a bit. Uh, most of what I'm showing is quantum computational chemistry, but it can be applied to other kinds of uh, computational chemistry as well. So the question is, is com quantum computational chemistry reproducible? It sounds like a kind of a stupid question because it's, I mean, we have a question. Yeah. Have a laser. And I bought this before Corona, and I didn't have the chance to, to use it. Come on, there. Question: We have a computer. If you don't know, this is the Hall 9000. This is one of the most famous computers in history, and we get an answer, right? Nothing else. Input, output. That's the idea of a computer. Everything is fine, so completely reproducible as long as we use the same computer, the same software, blah, 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 but it has to be completely reproducible. I will show you that there are some issues. First of all, in some computational projects, we have the butterfly effect, especially on molecular dynamics, okay, where you can start from tiny differences in the input and the positions of difference of uh, less than angstroms, and the results, the molecule will move to different directions. Okay, so indeed this is a kind of butterfly effect. Well, one molecule will go there, the other molecule will go there. Completely different pathway. So what will you do with that? Because in that case, it won't be reproducible. Well, it's actually very simple. The solution is doing proper sampling. You do thousand, a million runs of the same molecule doing something almost the same, and then you average it. And that's it. Then the average should be reproducible, right? So we are fine. So we don't have irreproducibility in computational chemistry as long as we don't have proper sampling. Now, this is not a problem in my particular field because we don't have this kind of uh, butterfly effects, but in some other fields, it, it, it happens. It can happen. A couple of days ago, if you see here, this is March 9, 2022. So it's really a couple of days ago. This article appeared in ACS Catalysis. It's a very important journal. Uh, it's an opinion article saying the, speaking about reproducibility in catalysis, obviously. But they were saying in one small part where reproducibility might appear to might, may appear to be more straightforward in computational catalysis. Challenges arise in the use of proprietary software or non-publicly available custom codes. Coordinates and energies for all computer structures should be published. Blah, 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 blah. Source code as well as input codes and output files be made available. What they are saying is basically no problem of irreproducibility in computational chemistry as long as you provide all the data. Okay, all the data means the geometry of the molecules, what program you are using, what method, exactly what method you are using, all the keywords that you are using, sometimes there are lots of keywords in the program to change uh, characteristics, but as long as you are doing that, it's input, output, no irreproducibility, you provide all the data, you have proper sampling if you need it, and that's it. This is the general idea of computational chemistry. Actually, uh, another paper, uh, another opinion article appear uh, like five years ago, saying exactly the same. Exactly the same. No problem of irreproducibility in computational chemistry. As long as you provide all the data, then you can reproduce it uh, anywhere, everywhere. Fine. This looks very nice. Then came, this was like seven years ago, an article that made a lot of noise in the community by one of the bad guys of computational chemistry, Dan Singleton. Uh, I'm not talking too much about uh, chemistry today. Sorry, it's again about chemistry today. <laughs> I, I will remember that. But anyway, they were dealing with this chemical re uh, reaction, organic chemistry. It doesn't matter the chemistry itself. And then what uh, Dan was saying is that having the profile of energy, which he more or less could take from the experiments from a lot of experiments, he could do the, more or less the barriers here and there. He said, using different methods, you have here samples of methods, 
then you will obtain whatever you want. Okay, this was the table of content uh, figure where you have the, a, a range of results so big that it's much bigger than the result itself. Depending on which method you're using, the results you will obtain. Or like some guys say about something similar, tell me what, the, what is the result that you want, I will tell you which method you have to use. What these people said in the end was computational prediction varied vastly, and it is not clear that any significant accurate information that was not already apparent from experiment could have been garnered from computations. <laughs> Basically, yeah, it might be reproducible, but it's useless, which didn't fall very well uh, to my friends in quantum chemistry, of course. One thing that, uh, one opinion that appeared much after this was of Laura Gagliardi, it's uh, an editor of Chuck's uh, Journal of American Chemical Society, one of the most important journals of chemistry, and she's a very famous uh, quantum computational chemist. And being editor of Chuck's, she had to say her opinion, because more and more articles appear giving us uh, computational data. So she said, as Chuck's associate editor, I cannot accept things like, we are not theorists, we only use theory to help characterize our structures, we use theoretical methodology similar to that used by adults. Use highest level of theory as you do the best experiment. Okay, so she's saying, of course, if you are using crappy methods, you will obtain crappy results. So in your, in your wet lab, you are not going to use crappy method if you want to publish in charge. Don't do the same in computational chemistry. Okay, because obviously your results will be useless, will be even irreproducible. So what she's saying, a lot of people are saying after, especially that article of Dan Singleton, there is no irreproducibility in computational chemistry using the correct method if you provide all the data and with proper sampling. Okay, we're still fine. You just need to know what you are doing. If you don't know what you are doing, and that's very common, because doing quantum computational chemistry is actually easy. But it's very easy to do it wrong. Okay, so ask a proper computational chemist how to do, what method to use, and then things will go much better. Okay. Now, if you are asking how many methods you have, because I'm speaking about crappy methods, you have thousands of methods only in the subfield of density functional theory, which is the kind of computations I do. Thousands of methodologies. You, we even have a poll selecting world in the world, in the whole world, we are voting what are our favorite methods, our favorite functional. That, it's very nice. It's a, you know, science doesn't work like a democracy. But sometimes this is also a kind of scientific approach. Not really. Uh, anyway, these kind of things are not going better nowadays that we have a lot. You see here a lot of uh, machine learning. That I cannot remember where I took this graph from. But you see the peaks in the, in the last years of machine learning and artificial intelligence are on every field. They're growing and this problem will grow that we are using crappy methods, simply as that. And then reproducibility, it's, it's off the picture. Okay, just between parentheses, is there an alternative way? Well, in the old days, like 30, 40 years ago, uh, they used a very simple method. They say that there were, are no bad theories, just bad reactions. And they choose a kind of the Texas sharpshoot uh, fallacy, where they don't try to do the chemistry and select the method, they select the chemistry that our method is working, that we know that it is working on. So we cannot fail with that that much, and we can reproduce and we can do everything because we are keeping the models as good as we can. The chemical molecules that we are going to compute I'm not going to be something that we cannot do with our, at that time, simple methods. Or 
as it was written at the temple of the oracle at Delphi of Apollo, know thy model. <laughs> Nothing to excess and surety brings ruin. This is actually written in, in Delphi in, in Greece. Um, this is very important. I always tell my students that knowing a model, a theory, it's only half of the issue. You need to know the limit of the model to apply it. If not, completely useless. Anyway, now I'm reaching the main core of my talk. It is this particular article that appeared uh, last year. Uh, again, the chemistry, it's only important for chemists, but this is a very, very, very important chemistry. It appeared on Nature Catalysis, it's a very important journal. They were doing a carbon-carbon bond formation with uh, this catalyst. <coughs> now, what's the issue here? They wrote it, the authors wrote it. Suzuki Miyara coupling, that's how it's called, is a practical and attractive carbon-carbon bond formation reaction. Now, carbon-carbon bond formation is the heart of organic chemistry. Okay, that was always the holy grail of organic chemistry. And there were almost no reaction, on, almost no method that can do that until palladium chemistry appear. There are Nobel laureates because of this topic. It's so important, I think it's, it's kind of a revolutionary, actually a kind of a Kuhnian revolutionary, if you, if you might say. The problem is that, but its industrial applications are limited because it is typically catalyzed by expensive palladium containing transition metal complexes. We need palladium, palladium is expensive. Palladium is complicated, it's uh, even a bit toxic. So we can do better, or we want to do it better without palladium. Here we show a robust and chemoselective and catalytic Suzuki mineral type coupling of aerodynamics with aerodynamics, sorry for non chemists, sounds very boring. But the important thing is catalyzed by amines, no palladium. This was a game changer. Suppose. Okay, now why palladium, we should care about palladium? Well, 35% of the palladiums come from Russia. Just saying. Now, it, it's even worse. In this article, which is about high tech, they were saying that uh, half of the neon grade high tech uh, neon gas. Okay, I don't know why they need neon for uh, doing semiconductors, but they need it apparently and that's coming from Ukraine. If you're going to buy a computer, buy today. Tomorrow it will be too expensive. Anyway, we want the reactions done without palladium. Uh, well, in this article, because if you want to publish it in nature kind of uh, journals, you need to do some computations. If not, it will be much more complicated. So some, some of these people, I don't know exactly who, did a computational profile, quantum computational profile of all the mechanisms, and they proved the mechanisms how it will work. Right? Fant fantastic article. So, uh, I will skip this part. Second. A couple of months after this, the editor wrote, the readers are alerted that the conclusions of this paper are subject to criticism. Subject to criticism means Twitter. Right? <laughs> that are being considered by the editor. So, for the editorial response, we'll follow the resol resolution of these issues. You see, there was a Twitter storm. Okay? People criticizing this article, saying, what were they saying? There is palladium. Come on. There are traces of palladium. Bet you that there are traces of palladium in, that, uh, in the medium. So, this has a very long history because there were many articles that were claiming exactly the same, different characteristics, different catalysts, but always were looking for transition metal free Suzuki type coupling reactions without palladium, basically. And all of them failed. Most of them because there were traces of palladium there. <laughs> traces, I mean, really traces, but per billion. But apparently palladium is so good as a catalyst that those parts per billions were the ones that were doing the reaction. Anyway, what happened with this one? 
a couple of articles appear, we conclude the uh, reinvestigation, blah, 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 blah highly robust, blah, 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 phosphine palladium complexes that are real in trend during the, basically, there was palladium. They were, the original authors were very, very, very careful, but still, it was so difficult to find it, but they, uh, other groups found that there was palladium there. Okay, it was not that organocatalyst, it was palladium that appeared when they were synthesizing the catalyst. So the synthetic method to produce the catalyst was the one that was catalyzing the reaction. <laughs> Another article in conclusion study, the trace palladium in the purified batches of amine was essential for, uh, again, PPB, part per billions of palladium. What this group and uh, Shu et al. did, well, they actually did the honorable thing. They uh, retracted it. Okay, so you can still see this article. Okay? At least this is not Hudliki, right? <laughs> yes. You can you can still see this article, but with the band they are retracted. Okay, uh, I'm not sure it sh if it should have been retracted. I will tell you why now. Uh, this was. Uh, an opinion of uh, Philip Ball, it's a famous writer of uh, chemistry and physics. Uh, he said, how important is that papers published in scientific journals are correct? Okay, clearly this paper was not correct. But there is another question that is arguably as important for the progress of science. Is it stimulating? Is it important? So he gives an example. The first report of C16, Fullerene, if you remember, they people received a Nobel Prize for this C16 molecule. In 1985, lacked any compelling evidence for the molecule football structure. The molecule they were proposing, they didn't have enough proof, but they published it anyway. Both referees and editors, and indeed the authors, were right to take the gamble. It was a gamble. They said, we don't have enough data to say this is exactly the molecule. They took the gamble, and it was correct. Similarly, the notion that a simple small molecule might do the job of an organometallic compound in catalyzing the Suzuki reaction, while perhaps seemingly likely, is worth airing. So it was a gamble. With C16, it worked. With this organocatalyst, it didn't work. But we still, he's saying, we still need to publish it. It's worth publishing. So facts are crucial, but so is leaving space for ideas. Okay. Now, these are some words of a uh, lead bitter. What, what a name, lead bitter. Okay, <laughs> anyway, uh, this was the author, the main author of the first article that was published like 20 years ago on cross coupling without palladium. Okay, not the article that I just shown you before, but one of the original articles that, with the same idea that was falsified. Okay. He says, one school of thought is that regardless of whatever transformation like this are or are not transition metal free, they are still synthetically useful. Yeah, there is palladium, he's saying, but it is useful. That reaction that we did is still useful, especially for an industrial chemistry standpoint. Synthetic procedures, however, are of no use unless they are reproducible. Is this reproducible? The thing that they are doing here, it is. You do exactly the same as they also did, and you will do cross-coupling. You will bond carbon-carbon. It is reproducible. In our case, the Suzuki coupling worked very well if the sodium carbonate came pre-contaminated with parts per billion levels of palladium. So as long as you have dirty reactants, it will work. But, OK, what he's saying in short word is we might be wrong. What, what we are postulating is wrong. No problem with that. But it is honest research. We are not trying to lie to anyone. We did honest research. It is useful. It is actually very useful. And it is absolutely reproducible. You just need dirty reactants. But it works. And you can test it. OK, now, this talk was about computational chemistry. What about this graph? I mean, 
the whole mechanism they were proposing of ca catalysis without palladium was wrong. But somebody came with a profile of energies and a whole reaction mechanism computed. And you will agree with me that there is no palladium in a computation if you are not putting PD in the input file, right? So what happens here? The authors actually gave a lot of instructions on how to reproduce their computations. Completely reproducible. The method is not the best. I don't agree with all the methods they choose, but, but the method is fine. I'm not going to read all this, don't worry. It is fully re reproducible from a computational chemistry perspective. Okay, we can't rep I can't reproduce exactly what they did. I have all the geometries, I have all the data, I have the program, I have everything. I can reproduce it without any problem. But in that way, can we explain everything <coughs> and anything with computational chemistry? Even something that it is completely wrong? I mean, this mechanism was wrong, and they prove it correct. They reproduced the experimental results in a reproducible way. But the experimental results were wrong. And they reproduce it anyway. So everything is reproducible here. So obviously reproducibility is not everything. And we have to be very careful with what we are saying with reproducibility here. So in principle, you don't need a wet lab to make your science irreproducible. <laughs> Maybe. Yes, technically you, you are fine, but in spirit, it's still irreproducible. We, we reproduce something that doesn't exist. So in my times, this is irreproducible. You just need a lot of imagination. Okay, so I like to say that there are three kinds of lies. Lies, dumb lies, and computational chemistry. <laughs> okay, just to finish my talk, I'm running out of time. What does it mean, reproducibility in computational chemistry? Maybe computation reproduces another computation. This is the basic dry definition of reproducibility in computational chemistry. I have all the data, I have everything, so is that good enough? Uh, by the way, this is Alex, my student. <laughs> Maybe computation reproduces the experiment. Maybe even if the experiment is wrong. This is what we call an explanation. Okay, the computer gives an explanation to the mechanism that was done ex experimentally. Okay, Alex is a half a computational guy, half a experimental guy. So, have both pictures there. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's experiment that should reproduce the computation, which what we call the prediction. Okay, in any case, reproducibility, even in computational chemistry, which sounds such a silly, simple, Term, it can get much more complicated. Okay, so with this, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you have questions? Yes, Ute has questions. Okay. I don't have to be the first. No, but you are the one with the. Okay. No, thank you, Sebastian. I, I really liked it. Whether it is right or wrong, but it was stimulating. <laughs> But I, I want to disagree with your, your approvement of, of uh, Philip Ball. Anyhow, I have my problems with him in general. But I don't think um, you, can, um, you should not refute a paper that is, let's say, that presents a wrong method. If you can present wrong theories, if the theories it is something different, or hypotheses, they can be stimulating and lo later turn out to be wrong, and you don't have to to refute them, because that's what theories are. But if you have a concrete method, and they, they claim this amines can be included, uh, can replace palladium in, in, the, in the catalyst, this is blunt wrong. It is not a hypothesis or anything, and it is not stimulating. If they had written, maybe the amines or other, other uh, uh, non-metals can, can replace palladium, that is another story, but not to give that concrete. I completely disagree. Well, I never say that I agree with uh, Philip Ball. Ah, I thought so. I, I, I think he has a point. 
his article was stimulating. Uh, and I think that, the, as uh, I think Voltaire said, perfect, how did he say, how did he say, perfect is the enemy of good? Yeah, but not wrong. <laughs> yes, but they, they really did a very good article, and they really did the chemistry correctly. It, just, it, it was just too much for the methodology. It was too complicated to find the palladium. They were sure there was no palladium. So they thought they were correct. Again, that was honest research. Uh -huh. They were not lying. How do, you and they know? How do you know? How do you know that they knew? How do I know? I read the article, and mm -hmm. as far as I can understand experimental chemistry, they did a lot to try to find the palladium, and they couldn't find it. They really did a lot to find it. They just didn't have the method to find palladium in such low concentrations. That, w that was too much. They needed a kind of a methodology that, that almost nobody has. Nobody has the possibility to check that concentration of palladium, except for some specific groups in the world. So the, the article was fine. They were wrong. But it was not that they were doing something scientifically wrong. For sure, they were not lying. Any other question? Yeah. Harry, Harry has the question. Maybe you ah. should stop uh, sharing, sharing the screen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we can see the other room. So Harry has the question. Yes, Harry. Yes. Oh, yes, thanks very much. I, I found that <coughs> particularly fascinating, and we'll write to you for a copy of the uh, slides or the paper or something. But it seemed to me that the original experiment was a perfectly normal scientific experiment. Um, it would be reproducible. It's just that people didn't know how it was working. Uh, this would be exactly like the uh, T-laser experiment, which I studied way back in 1972. There were people who could make the T-laser work. There were people who couldn't make the T-laser work. The trick, as we found out a lot later, was that one of the leads in the circuit diagram had to be very short. But because you learned how to build the laser from the circuit diagram, it wouldn't occur to you to arrange the physical parts in such a way that that particular lead was short. But anybody who spent some time in somebody else's lab would have done the experiment with a short lead because they'd have put the whole thing together in the same way, but without knowing why it was effective, only if you'd been to the other person's lab. And one can well imagine that in this case, if you'd been to the other person's lab, you might have got some palladium contamination on your lab coat or something so that it, it went into the catalyst, the non polysose later. But in fact, it was, it was a sort of tacit knowledge problem. So I think it's a, it's a terrific experiment. And it seems to me that the experiment worked in the following sense. If you're worried about getting palladium from, from Russia and you want to do a catalyst without palladium, then, well, you do it because all you need is that contamination, which presumably costs nothing and doesn't have to be got from Russia, you know, because it's spread around the world already. Yeah, exactly. That was uh, what uh, this uh, Levite was saying. The experiment is useful. We don't need to yeah. buy palladium. The palladium is already there. It's contamination. But yes, it is useful. And, and uh, I agree with every word that you said. This is an experiment, as I, as I said before, completely reproducible as long as you're doing it in the right way, in the right yeah. way. If you do the organocatalyst <laughs> without palladium, <coughs> this won't work. But if you synthesize the organocatalyst with palladium, which is part of the process of synthesizing this, then it works. Is the organic pro uh, uh, compound necessary? Is the amine what? necessary for the catalyst? Without the amine, it didn't work. It didn't work, okay. It didn't work. Now, it was not because of the amine. Now, mm -hmm. we know. It. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Just a comment. But the objective of the paper was one thing, and what you are saying is a different thing. The objective that was that they can synthesize compounds without palladium. This is why the paper was retracted. Yeah, yes, you're right. The, the, the paper was wrong. The paper. The it was wrong. So doesn't matter what, what the, the, uh, if it stimulates or not. 
Yes. People were uh, done similar uh, uh, wrong uh, assumptions in the past, and it stimulates the same way. And I guess people will try to, to do the same thing in the future, and then we'll fail again. Uh, this is because of the chemistry. They were wrong in the chemistry. So this is my point. Yeah, they were wrong. They were completely wrong. What they wrong in publishing it? Because at that point, they didn't really know that it was wrong. They thought it was right. And it was revolutionary if it was right. Still, it works. One small comment. I would say it's like you have a gene in the background that is mutated and you don't know it's there. <laughs> and it's actually doing the action. If you want to make, draw parallels. But uh, I want to ask, if you go to the computational analysis that they did, can you find traces there? Now that you know that palladium is playing a role <laughs> where <coughs> something in the formula would have, you know, it's, it's, it's there, it's just not... Not, I, I don't know how to say it. Um, somehow it was into the calculation that there is a, a something that. No, 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 no. No. That's one thing of uh, computational chemistry. It's as clean as it can be. Any effect that you didn't put on purpose, it won't appear. If you don't put palladium, or if you don't put, I don't know, a solvent model of these characteristics. Uh, Whatever you are not putting inside, you don't get it. There's no error about that. So if you look into the how it worked or how the model suggests it works, where does it fail? Can, we, can you find a place where it's not working? They, I, I know what, uh, what happened because it happened to us a lot of times, right? You play with all the possibilities until you find something that more or less it's in the borderline of the error bars of the experiment, and you say, well, this is the best that we can do. <coughs> OK, sometimes it's the best that you can do, really. Computational chemistry, clearly, it's not infallible. Thank you very okay. much.